gather. Welcome to Sunday morning worship. I hear you guys. entire thing but a good chunk Isaiah 44 1 says 
But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord whom you made, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Read this with me. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And are you my witnesses? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. That is our God. In the next verses, he goes on to continue to, to basically tell the people how foolish idolatry is, how, how men make idols out of their own hands, and what those same pieces of wood that they use to make idols, they use it to burn their food upon and, and do all these other things that dumb idols do, you know? And God says, I alone am God. And in Isaiah 45, he continues on, I am the Lord God, there is no other like me. He goes on to talk about how he uses King Cyrus to uh, bring his people into captivity, and yet he is still God. He is still sovereign. He is still God. He is still ruler, and alone there is no other God deserving of all worship and praise. It is God alone. And so we keep that in mind. Let's continue to worship this morning as we sing praise his name and next before the throne of God. Of heaven, starry heights, the lights of the evening, dancing in silent skies, brilliance of morning, breaking. Amen. 
to Jesus, Lamb for sinners slain. Name above all other names, praise Him. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Let all His wondrous works declare His praise. Oh.
Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you alone are God, that there is no other creator, no other savior but you. Lord, and you have called us to be your own. You have sealed us. You have hidden us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we know that you who made the heavens and the earth to proclaim your glories and to exalt your name, you have saved us to do the very same thing, God. You have bought us so that we, with our lives, can live lives that glorify you and put you on display and with the rest of creation, sing your praises. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to do that as a body, as we continue to seek your face, O oh God, and how we worship. In your word, O oh Lord, may you be exalted this very morning as we continue and seek by your grace, your power working in us, that we would not just be hearers, but doers of your word. Be glorified, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, Redeemer's Church. It is a privilege to bring the Word of God to you uh, today. Uh, Redeemer's kids, you guys are joyfully dismissed to go and learn about Jesus with Mr. Stephen Fouts. And uh, Stephen, good luck with this huge crew of, uh, of kids. No, no, that's good, that's good. Yeah, let's give them a little encouragement. I'm glad you got some backup back there because uh, that's a large party that you are throwing in Redeemer's Kids. All right, the rest of you, take your Bibles, open up to Genesis 35. Genesis 35 is our text uh, for this morning. Who you're seen with and who uh, you hang out with has a lot to do uh, with how you're perceived, for right or for wrong, uh, and for good or for bad. Uh, the people that we choose to associate with and how, who we spend our time with uh, are, are, are something that affects how people perceive us. That's why uh, celebrities like uh, Taylor Swift, it's been a long time since we had a Taylor Swift illustration uh, this morning. T people like Taylor Swift have to be so careful with who they spend time with because uh, if, if she's out with somebody or she's working with somebody or someone opens for one of her concerts and they said something dumb or said something bad or have on their endless record of history recorded on social media had some sort of bad reference or something, it it reflects on and it and it uh, it makes her look bad. That's why when things like uh, photos of previous presidents with uh, Jeffrey Epstein uh, show up on the internet, it's like ooh, that's not fun. Uh, on both sides of the aisle, uh, notice that's bipartisan. Uh, it's it's just it it brings up its own scandal in and of itself because we have this perception as humans that uh, certain people uh, should not. Uh, be have we should not be spending time with certain types of people. Uh, that there are people that are untouchable, they're unclean, uh, they're un, they're un they're unapproved, and therefore we, as are walking through our daily and normal life, should not be spending time with them. This idea is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm so thankful this morning that we, ha we serve uh, a God, a Savior, who spends time with and loves and makes covenants with tax gatherers and sinners. And so, as we open up the book of Genesis uh, 35, you need to read it uh, the same way uh, some, a, a Jewish person, uh, a, an Israelite, uh, as they walked into the promised land, you need to read this text the same way uh, that they would have uh, when they received it from Moses as, they, uh, as Moses appropriated and, and took this story and this text and this history and prepared the people of Israel to enter into the promised land through stories like this. It's, this. it's this kind of thinking, this kind of religious thinking, this kind of moral thinking that, oh no, I can't be with them, or oh no, I can't hang out with them, or oh no, they're inappropriate for me to spend time with, uh, that really highlights and helps us understand the great grace and uh, amazing truth of this text. So, uh, that is uh, what we're going to see in Genesis 35, God meet with sinners. God meet with sinners. Look at uh, chapter 35, verse 1. God said to Jacob, Arise, 
Go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. A few things to note in that text as we uh, jump in. First of all, when God refers to himself in the third person, you're probably in a little bit of trouble, right? It's kind of like the, the whole little scene when, when your mom called you by your first middle and last name. Uh, Brent, how do he say, Asu, get over here, right? That's, that's, that means you're in, in trouble or when you start referring, talk to someone who refers to themselves in the third person, you can tell that they're, they're trying to, uh, to make a point. When my kids, when I'm talking with my kids and I'm talking about how uh, your father uh, is very blah, 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 you know, they know they're in a certain amount of, of trouble. Well, here in the text, the Lord refers to himself uh, in, in the third person, build, make an altar there to the God who appeared to you. Uh, so in this text, he, he reminds Jacob of his history, of how when he was running from his brother who wanted to murder him, he spent the night on some random piece of land uh, and slept with a rock as his pillow, and God showed up. God appeared to him there. God made promises to him uh, as he was running for his life. He made promises to him there, and there God promised to be with him uh, all throughout his life. And so here at this point, God's like, hey, remember? Remember when I uh, met with you? It's been 30 years for Jacob since that event. It's been 30 years. 30 years has passed since Jacob on that night vowed that he would return to Bethel. It's been 20 years almost enslaved in a foreign land under Laban. And even after that, after Jacob left Laban and returned to the promised land, all fearful to come before Esau, it's been another 10 years. Another 10 years. And Jacob has been busy building a house. He's been forming alliances. He's been causing problems. But by the time we get to Genesis 35, 30 years have passed, and God says, hey, it's time. Come and meet with me. That's point number one on your outline. God is calling me to meet with him. God is calling me to meet with him. Here's why that's such a scandal. Jacob is a lying, cheating polygamist who is perverted, a fear-driven idolater who is hoarding his mother, his money. He is a horrific father who has done nothing to protect his daughter and is now the dad of two murderers and nine money-plundering, lust-driven sons. That's who he's become. That's who he is now. Jacob, first of all, was never that significant in the first place. His father was a nobody, and his grandfather is most widely known for giving his mother away, grandmother away, twice to other men. And this is, this is the heritage, the lineage that he has uh, adopted as his own. God calls this man, after 30 years of this behavior, to come and meet with him in Bethel. See, God has been meeting with tax gatherers and sinners long before Jesus was ever born. We argue and we talk about how the God of the Old Testament, all oh, he's were or this, and the God of the New Testament is much nicer, and we much prefer the Jesus of the New Testament. But the truth is, the truth in the situation is that God has been God, a God of grace and a God of mercy, a God who meets with sinners, for a for all throughout old and new testament all throughout human history it's part of his unchanging character and so here in the text after such a, a horrific chapter where jacob does nothing the last week after such a horrific uh, section of scripture where god uh, where god isn't even mentioned after years of that God says, come meet with me. Maybe you're in uh, this similar situation, or maybe recently you've been uh, called back to the Lord. It's been years. 
It's been years since all the stuff that your uh, grandmother or your mother taught you. It's been years since those days in Sunday school. A lot has occurred in between the decades between those moments and then and a lot of the things you thought you'd never do, you've done, and a lot of the, the failures that you could have never imagined have come in, uh, the brokenness, the, the, cl- the clarity of who you are in and of yourself has been revealed over those years, and to people like you and I, God says at this very moment, come meet with me. Come meet with me. This is the truth of God's grace. It's just like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. The Lord is looking for his straying children to return to him. He's looking and scanning the horizon at any given moment. And upon the mere glimpse of your silhouette, he sets off running. This is the God that we serve. This is the God of the Old and the New Testament. This is the God who says that since we have so great a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, this is, this is the, the posture, the ever-present posture of our God today. This is the ever-present posture of our God of grace today. Come and meet with me, is what he says. In sending his son, Jesus Christ, he's saying, come and meet with me, and all of these things. Now, let, let's be careful here. Let's, let's be careful. Let's uh, delineate a couple very specific things uh, for us as Christians. Uh, I want to be careful in this text. Uh, the first time that Jacob met with God at Bethel, he didn't see it coming. He didn't even really know uh, so much of the God who appeared to him there on, on that uh, morning and that vision. He, he discovered truth about that God that he really hadn't worshipped or even uh, spent any time with uh, before that event. Jacob received, Jacob met with, God met with Jacob on that moment without Jacob having any idea of what was coming. Now this, this is different. This is God saying, Jacob, come and meet with me. And the two are, are, are different. And yet we kind of, we have a sense of both. When God meets with us unexpectedly, and then when God calls with us to meet with him, those are two separate things. And yet we've experienced those as followers of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian this morning, you kind of intuitively know what I'm talking about. Because no matter how long ago it was for you, maybe it was decades, maybe it was last month, there was a moment in your life where God unexpectedly showed up with you in glory. He like showed up, he showed himself, you understood and perceived the truth about Jesus, the holiness of God, your own sin, your need for a savior. Like there was a moment in time, you didn't see it coming, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, but God just hits you like a Mack truck on the freeway. He hits you with his glory. You were struck by his holiness and you saw and believed in Jesus at that moment. That was an amazing moment, just like Jacob had unexpectedly in Bethel in his first visit. You didn't see it coming. You didn't make it happen. You didn't deserve it. You couldn't earn it. And some, some of you might not be too far away from that moment. Some of you might be having that moment right now. You came to church, you're like, ah, I don't know, what do I do? And you're showing up here this moment. Well, this is God appearing, coming to you through his word, telling you the truth about Jesus. And this is, a come to, this is God coming down and meeting with you. But what's happening in Genesis 35 is different. God is not meeting with Jacob. God is calling Jacob to meet with him. And that, there's a difference, isn't there? My wife and I, uh, it's our 18th wedding anniversary, and she deserves applause for that. We first met in the lobby of our previous church, and uh, I remember that day 
uh, vividly as if it was yesterday. Um, I remember walking up to her and uh, being introduced to her by Ron Boyer. Got to thank that guy. Um, and and uh, I remember I was struck the moment I saw her uh, because she was wearing like two inch heels and she was like a giant hovering over me. And I, my first thought when seeing her was, wow, she's tall. And I was shaking her hand, right? Her first memory of me uh, is, is of that same moment uh, because I was running around as the intern of the church and I was, <laughs> I was I, she doesn't remember anything other than the fact that I was wearing a big old one of those big old cameras. How Asian is that? Right? Like, I was supposed to be taking, that's not how I ride, okay? That's not, that's not what I, but at that day, on that moment, I was doing that. And so I, I had this monster camera, and I was taking pictures of ministry things for the church. Um, and, and so that was a, a weird, awkward first introduction, and not the introduction that I would plan. Uh, you better believe it was different on our first date. On our first date, uh, as we were preparing uh, to go out uh, and uh, have our first date, have some tiramisu at uh, Macaroni Grill just down the street uh, 17 years ago. Um, that was a totally different event. I wasn't packing my camera, okay? Uh, I wasn't, I was very careful. I, I knew exactly what I was going to wear, and I remember exactly what she was wearing that night. My, uh, the, the whole event was so manicured and so carefully thought through uh, that my, my roommate, Jeff, was like, hey, hey, Brent, you can't take this girl out in your beat-up Honda Civic, okay? Like, I, my, I, the car I was driving, uh, this black Honda Civic CRX, literally there was duct tape holding the front bumper on to the car, and, and that was an improvement from the back bumper, which was just running free and just making noise whenever I was driving, okay? So Ron's like, uh, no, Jeff's like, no, 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 you're not, you're not, you're not, <laughs> you're not driving that car. You're going to take my car. She'll never, ever speak with you again if you take, pick her up in that car. So uh, used his car. Remember exactly where, what I was wearing. Remember exactly where we sat in that moment. Every moment of that first date is, is just ingrained in my head. And uh, it's, it's been nine, 18, 19 years since that first date. And uh, so thankful for it. There's a, there's a difference at an unexpected encounter, and there's a difference with when you intentionally and purposely uh, plan to meet. So, for Jacob, he was sleeping in the dirt with a, a rock as his pillow when God unexpectedly showed up in his life. From this point in Genesis 35, God's saying, come meet with me, and Jacob gets that there's a difference. When God calls you to meet with him, you prepare. You prepare. Point number two, when God calls me to meet with him, bury my idols. They're dead anyway. When God calls me to meet with him, Bury my idols. They're dead anyway. Look at verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that is near Shechem. That is near Shechem. So at this point, Jacob the passive, sinfully passive father, he kind of, he gets it. And in an uninitiated way, God didn't say, hey, clear out your idols before you come and meet with me. But Jacob, uh, knowing the God 
Knowing enough about God, knowing enough about God's holiness, knowing enough about God's glory is like, hey, we're being called to Bethel and we can't just go like this. We need to repent. We need to cast off. We need to turn around because when God says, come meet with me, that's an amazing, gracious, and yet also life-defining event. Come meet with me, says the holy God of Israel. Come meet with me, says the creator of the universe. And Jacob, getting at least a piece of this, is, turns to his family and is like, hey, we're going to go down to Bethel and we got to clear out all the idols. Now, notice in this text that there, there's idols, there's even uh, perhaps even jewelry, there's all the foreign gods that they had, the rings that were in their ears, all those things in verse 4, and Jacob gets rid of them. So, notice a, a few things. The first mention of idolatry in this family was just a few chapters ago. It was Rachel stealing the household gods of her father, Laban. A and... She hid those. We saw that a few weeks ago. And she gets away with it and brings them with them. But now, here, just a few chapters later, there are lots of them. There are multiplied idols in this home. Not only is it has to do with probably this little pint-sized sculpture that Rachel stole from her father, now it has to do with the way they appear. With the, with the things that they put on their, their body. Now their idolatry has consumed to their appearance and how they want people to see them, how they see themselves. Notice that there's multiplied idols. See, it just starts with one and then it tends to multiply. Perhaps they received some more when they ransacked Shechem City and took all the wives and the children and all of the possessions. They're taking on more idols, and Jacob knows that when you come and appear before God, you got you to get rid of those. You got to turn away from those. There is a, a, a moment where every, as every believer is called to come and meet with God on a Sunday morning or a taking communion like we're taking communion uh, this morning. Uh, as we gather together and remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus and his victorious resurrection, there's this, this moment God comes and calls us to meet with him. He calls us to remember the sacrifice of his son where we, man, we, we better prepare. And, and you better bury those idols. Some people have been uh, confused by the wording of verse 4 that Jacob hid the idols under a tree. And it seems like there would, in our modern mindset, well, if he hid them, that's because he's going to go back and get them and that this isn't a truly repentant thing. Let me assure you that's not what's going on here in this text. Why bury them? Instead of burn them or instead of throwing them out with the trash or other one other way, you can see in the context uh, to bury under a tree is what they did in a, it's their funeral. Jacob had a funeral for his dead idols. He just buried them because they were already dead. They were gone. They were a thing of the past. And, and so, what we see is that Jacob takes seriously being called into God's presence and leaves his idols behind. Never to pick them up again. Never. Now when we talked about idolatry, we talked a, a few weeks ago about surface idols and source idols and we worked through uh, some of that just briefly. But one of the main points is that uh, dead idols kill you. Your dead idols will kill you and because of what happens in Genesis 35, I think it's worth remembering that truth. Your dead idols will kill you. Let me remind you of some things here. Number one, um, just kind of out of the example of Rachel, even in this text. Rachel had an idol problem. And it happened, and it was clear 
way before she stole her father's idols. It was clear even before that. In Genesis 30, verse 1, uh, Jacob is having children through Leah, the older sister, the unwanted sister, uh, because God is, a, uh, God is gracious and loving and merciful. God is using uh, Leah. God is blessing Leah uh, in that way. And Rachel is bitter and angry. And she goes to her husband and says, Give me children or I shall die. That's idols. That's idolatry. It's not a statue. It's an idol in her heart. One chapter later, <clears throat> Jacob is leaving Laban. Laban's household gods have been stolen by Rachel. She's put them under her seat and pretends it's her time of the month, or it really is. It's unknown. But Jacob, after being accused by Laban, says this, Jacob says in Genesis 31, verse 32, anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. Shall not live. Now, Laban didn't find his gods. But the consequences, nonetheless, were still very clear. Look at verse uh, 16. Fast forwarding in the, the life of Rachel. They journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor. She had hard labor, and when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. As her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb, and it is the pillar of Rachel's tomb which is there to this day. Rachel got killed by her idols. Rachel got killed by her idols. They did her in in the end. Give me children or I shall die. Anyone with whom you find your God shall not live. And here she is receiving what she wanted more than anything else her entire life. And it kills her. It's a sober story, a sober reminder, a sober reality for each and every one of us to consider this morning because in a, a way that we can't see our idols deep down in our hearts are destroying our family, causing destruction in our bodies, driving us to things that create chaos, and in the end, we'll get us. So when God calls us to meet with Him, we throw those things off because they're destroying us. But more than that, even more important than the fact that your idols are killing you, they are an offense to the God who created and saved you. They are an offense for the God who created and saved you. There's been several stories over the last couple years of unveilings of portraits. When you're an important person who people think should be remembered historically, they'll commission an artist, a professional, to paint your portrait, and then they will place it somewhere, like in a national gallery or in the White House or in uh, a palace somewhere, and uh, for your likeness to be remembered throughout generations. This is a common and normal thing, and uh, it's quite humorous at the unveiling of these portraits when the uh, portraits aren't that good. Like, like we've had several situations like this occur in, uh, in our recent history. There was a portrait of Prince William uh, that was painted for him and is now at this moment hung in his uh, 
in the, in the palace in England, and uh, the portrait was called Fatherhood. And I should have uh, had it pointed it up for you uh, this morning, but it was uh, uh, an homage to the fact that Prince William had just become a father. And so, rightfully so, they pull off the cloth off of this portrait, and there is this picture for all time and all generations of Pris- Prince William looking exhausted, red in his face and just kind of like this turned to the side and everyone like laughed when it unveiled that that'd be one thing for for your likeness to be remembered like that through all generations imagine for us this morning that i painted a portrait of you and that we hung it in a museum here for all time in here in ventura county and this portrait was the worst thing on the planet. The eyes were wrong. You had this dead expression. You looked exhausted. The mouth was off. You didn't, it didn't even look anything like you. You know those pictures that your kids draw of you is ten times worse, right? Well, that hanging up in a museum, you might laugh when a kid brings to you something like that. But that hanging in a museum for all time for people to think, oh, look, yeah, there, I remember that person. That's awful, right? No one would wish that on anyone in this room. Uh, idols are ugly caricatures of the most glorious, of the most holy, the most powerful, and the most loving God of the universe. They're spaghetti portraits, you know, like the dried spaghetti glued on it. They're ugly and awful mischaracterizations of the true God. They're lies about the true God, saying that that God, the true God is not enough. I need this God. And everything in the existence of an idol the things that we run to when we're afraid, the, the control, the, the people's approval, the, all of these things that we've talked about as idolatry, they are an affront to the character of the all-sufficient, almighty, all-loving God who sent his son to die for you so that you would walk away from those idols and find life, an eternal life, in his name. So, bury them. Have the funeral. Kill them every day because God is glorious. They're an offense to who he is. In this text, Jacob and the whole family bury the idols. And we don't know what they were. We don't know what they uh, were, what what those idols were, what gods they were worshiping, what they were looking for, but we do know that when you, when God says, come and meet with me, you bury them because they're already dead. They already don't do anything, and they are an affront to the character of God. So when God says, come and meet with, God is calling you to meet with him, what a gracious and amazing thing that is. It's an opportunity for us this morning as we uh, partake of communion together, it's an opportunity for us to examine ourselves and make sure that we take communion in a worthy manner to make sure that we are repenting and, and, and bearing these sins and walking away from these things. And coming before a God who loves us through His Son, Jesus Christ, and worshiping Him and remembering Him and uh, singing praises to Him because He has saved us by grace and is at work in uh, us even this day. Look what happens next um, in the text. In, In Genesis 35, look at verse 5. I love this. As Jacob is making his way towards Bethel, as he promised 30 years ago that he would do. As they've left their idols behind them, look how verse 5 opens up. As they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. There were people who wanted vengeance. There were families who wanted their daughters and grandchildren back. 
and they were in harm's way, Jacob was right. But God was gracious. A terror from God fell upon the cities. And Jacob came to Luz. Notice that that is Bethel, but it's not what we call Bethel. It's what the Canaanites called Bethel. In the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him, verse 7, and there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Note this verse, verse 8, and Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried under an oak, tree, an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Anon Bakuth. Verse 9. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Now, hold on there a moment. We'll go back to Deborah and the nurse in a moment. What God does here is he follows up on what seems to be a uh, preparation because God has already promised that Jacob's name would no longer be Jacob. It would be changed to Israel. And that's, we saw that chapters ago. What God does here, in in a way that is reminiscent of what he did with Abraham, who was once called Abram, but at that moment when God changed his name, God came in and said, hey, you're, you're not that old man. You're not just the father of that. You're the father of many nations. And so God changed Abram's name to Abraham. He did the same with Sarah, who was known as Sarai, who would be known as Sarah from that point forth. And from that moment when God declared it, you shall no longer be known as, you shall no longer be called Abram, you shall no longer be called Sarai. They are from that moment in Scripture referred to by the name that God had given them. Here in this text, it's different. It's different. You can see, n- not only did God sit there and clarify what, uh, what his new name was, but you can see in, uh, even just in a few verses later, in verse 14, after Jacob has been given a new name, verse 14, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob's still being referred to by his old name. Verse 20, and Jacob set a pillar over her tomb. There's a back and forth between his new name and his old name. Verse 21, Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. While Israel lived in that land, and while Israel, the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel, goes on and on and on, back and forth, Jacob, Israel, Jacob and Israel. And it's almost like the text cannot decide what his true name should be. And this has confused theologians and pastors because it's not like what God did for Abraham and Sarah. Uh, it's, It's more like what Jesus did for Simon when he renamed Simon Peter. Because Peter is referred to as Peter for the bulk of the rest of the New Testament, except several pointed moments where Jesus or Peter himself refer to himself by his old name, Simon particularly moments where Simon is living like his old self. Not his new calling as an apostle, not his new uh, calling as a child of God, but living like the old man born in sin. And while it's not 100% for Jacob and Israel, it seems to be the bulk of the time when the Bible is calling Jacob Israel, Jacob is walking in the promises of God. 
looking forward to and trusting in the promises that God has for his future. And by and large, a lot of the times when God refers to Jacob as Jacob, he's being his old self. He's being his old self. All of this to point out a truth. It's the third point in our outline is this. I am new in the presence of God. I am new in the presence of God. I think this renaming of Jacob to Israel is much more helpful to us as New Testament Christians than, say, the renaming of Abraham and Sarah. Because when we come into this room this morning to meet with God and to partake in communion, when we come in, the renaming event where we were made new, when, we, when God came in and exploded into our lives and changed us forever, that's, for many of us, years in the past. And since that day, there have been great moments of victory where we've seen God clearly at work, where we're being like Jesus and walking with Jesus, where we're making advances, where we're putting behind sin, where we're burying idols, and we're living and glorifying Jesus. We're like in love with Jesus. There's been moments, and since that moment, where we have been closely walking in this new life, this new identity that God has given to us, and yet there are moments perhaps like some of us have experienced this last week, where we're, we're kind of living in our old ways, right? Some people in this room are, are come here, believers who are going to take communion today, who are going to need to repent because they barely thought, you barely thought about God at all this last week. Just like chapter 34, where he's not mentioned at all. But that's old you. That's old, pre-Christ, pre-Holy Spirit, you. And, and how many of us in these moments can, can think back and can go back to that old self. It's the things that are natural man. It's the old self in us that, as Paul talks about in the book of Romans, us doing the things that we don't want to do and us not doing the things that we want to do. It's the old person that we God calls us to put off every day and put on the new self. And so this morning for us is we take communion is a reminder of the new identity that was given to us when we believed in Jesus. This morning is a new reaffirmation of those truths that this is who we are. It's an opportunity for us for the thousandth time to put off that old self and to put on the new. Every day. Every day. Who are you right now? It's a strange question, isn't it? It's strange that God says, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And so he called his name Israel. But that's a, a strange sentence, and yet when you look at it, how necessary. How, ne- how absolutely necessary. You were the deceiver, and now you wrestle with God in like a great way. You were that, but now you're new in Christ Jesus. We as, even as saved believers, are tempted every day to put our identity into things, relationships, achievements. And God has given us a, a new identity. You are not what you do, or you are not who, those who love you, or you are not the sum of everybody's approval of you. You are not your success. You are not your failures. You are not the sum of your homes, your bank accounts, the goodness of your children, your style, your clothing. You are what Christ has made you through his death and resurrection.
It's easy to forget, though, isn't it? It's simple to forget. It's simple to leave behind what Christ has made us and to keep and to go back to that old way. And, and so when God calls us to meet with Him, like this morning, it's an opportunity for us to remember. It's an opportunity for us to remember who we truly are and to praise God that we are not what we used to be. It's easy to get into the rut, in the routine, where we lose our first love. Where we, like the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3, who are wealthy and secure, we consider ourselves to be healthy and well-clothed and prepared, and yet we are destitute, naked, and poor. It's easy for us to be like the Israel as they return to the land. Instead of rebuilding the temple of God, doing the work of God, get, build, get busy decorating our own houses. Or the new church in Jerusalem that got saved after Pentecost and just want to hang around and keep doing this Pentecost thing instead of getting about the business that God has for them in preaching the truth about Jesus Christ to Samaria and the nations beyond. It's easy for us to get in this funk where we hold a form of godliness but have denied its power like Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. And this morning is your opportunity by God to repent of that apathy, of that distraction, of those idols, of that old way of life, and to walk in what Christ has made you through his death and resurrection. Before Christ, we were lost in sin. Now we are alive in Christ. Before Christ, we were enslaved by guilt and shame. Now in Christ, we are liberated. We are free and are slaves of righteousness. Before we were spiritually dead. Now we are alive in Christ. Before we were lost in works and self-righteousness, now we are accepted in Jesus Christ. Before we were sons of disobedience, now we are children of God. Before we were blind and dead, now we are alive, seeing the truth of Jesus Christ. Before we were without hope in the world and separated from God, but now we have been brought in by Christ. We have a wonderful future prepared for us, earned for us by Jesus Christ. This is the truth in which we live every day. This is the truth that we desperately need. If the Lord brought you here this morning by His sovereign hand, and I know He did, it's because you need this reminder. You're new in Christ. You're loved, a recipient of grace, a child of God, a member of His church, and you are in the future going to be, you are going to be made new with Him forever. And you need that truth. Because even as uh, Jacob goes and serves God, we see that he serves in the midst of tragedy. Four tragedies happen throughout the rest of the chapter. The first one is the death of uh, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse. Happens in the middle of his worship. Second, as we already saw, is Rachel died during the childbirth of Ben, Benjamin. She names him son of sorrow, 
And Jacob, or Israel, renames him. Jacob's third sorrow is mentioned on the heels of Rachel's death. Reuben, his firstborn son, commits incest with Rachel's maid, Jacob's concubine. His final sorrow in this chapter is the death of his aged father, Isaac. What a grace of God, too, in the midst of the trial, for God to call Jacob into his presence. For God to move Jacob to leave his idols behind which would have inevitably failed him in these four tragedies. For God to remind him of his new identity and of his promises that he absolutely would need as three people die and as his children fail him. Like, what a grace of God that as we walk through this life, as we walk in Uh, obedience, that God protects us, He guides us, and He gives us what we need to walk through the valleys of this life, to see Him, to worship Him, and to be faithful to Him forever. This morning, um, we get the closest equivalent as New Testament believers to what God called Jacob to in Genesis 35. God called Jacob to go to Bethel, where God meets with people, and to erect for him an altar there and to sacrifice for him as he promised. Now, as Christians, we believe that Jesus has has offered himself as the final sacrifice, and we as Christians are called to remember that sacrifice as we partake in communion. So I'm going to invite Dan up here. And uh, I just want all of you to take this time. Go ahead and close your Bibles, turn off your phones. We're just going to have a moment before the Lord. Paul gives this warning in 1 Corinthians 11. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we're judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Paul takes this moment and and calls the Corinthian church to repentance. Bury the idols, turn away, and... Walk in the new life that Christ has given you. So as um, Dan plays some music over us, I just encourage you to take that moment as prayer before the Lord right now, acknowledging those idols, acknowledging that old way that you have been living in this past week searching your heart for any sin that is uh, that you have yet to turn away from, to confess that to Jesus, to ask for forgiveness, and partake. If you're unwilling to do so, and you're holding on to something for your own sake, just pass that tray along. No one's watching, no one's judging. If you're still holding on to that and clinging on to that, just 
for your own sake, but that you would this morning repent and enjoy all that Christ has made us through his death and resurrection. Take this moment and prepare your hearts and then we'll partake together. Carefully separate those cups and take out the bread. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do this in remembrance of the Lord together. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim the Lord's death together. Father, we are trusting you. We are believing you in this moment. We are worshiping you. We are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we who were sinners have been made new. We who were walking in destruction and death have been given life through your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of Jesus and that in him we have life. We thank you for the the bread, the body that was broken, and we confess that it should have been us, it should have been our body, it should have been our broken body because it was our sin. We deserve that. We thank you for the cup. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus spilled out. We thank you that this blood cleanses us from our sin. And as, Lord, as we remember the death of your Son, we remember that his death has given us life, and we remember that his resurrection 
gives us power. So, Lord, with my brothers and sisters who have repented this morning of the old way of their old idols, Lord, empower us to live a supernatural life walking with your Spirit, with your Word, in your Son, Jesus Christ, in the promises that you have given, Lord, empower us to, Lord, be used of you in this world as we worship you, as you come and meet with us, Lord, use us in our families, with our friends, in our neighborhoods, our co-workers, Lord, use us in our own homes, in our marriages that we might glorify and honor you by pointing others to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that is in Christ. We thank you for the power of your spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that at this moment we can stand and worship you and praise you because you are the glorious God, the gracious God, and we, you have a throne of grace that we have come to. We worship you for that. We thank you, and we praise your name. And all God's people said, let's stand and worship him together.
You guys may be seated. Got a couple of announcements for you before we send you out. My name is Dan. Thank you for joining us for Sunday morning worship today. Uh, we have our Redeemer's Church app. There's a QR code there if you like to bust out your phone, scan it, download it. And you can text us through that number there. Or use the app and send us a prayer request. We would love to pray for you. The staff prays for the body, for one another each week. And we would love to do that and minister in that way for you guys. Uh, giving. There are, there are the offertory boxes in the back on your way out. You guys, if you would love to give, um, you can do so through that or through the app and give online. Outside, through these doors and to your right and down those stairs out in the courtyard there is guest reception please come say hi and if you're new we would love to give you a gift but come join us uh, as we are out there fellowship fellowshipping come say hi to us come come meet our elders and uh we'll see you out there redeemers essentials it's a three-week class about membership and uh we'll go over what it what it means to belong to a body and uh what it looks like to be a member of this church it's starting in February 11th after Sunday morning worship. If you're thinking about membership, please come join us. Uh, you can register online through the app or on, a website, on our website. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for announcements. Thank you so much for joining us for Sunday morning this worship. Man, what a great reminder it is this morning um, just of what Christ has done for us, how we were made new and we belong to him, not to this world, not to anything we owned. Uh, you guys are loved. Have a great week.